Hello, and welcome to Global Scalpels, a podcast dedicated to the 5 billion people worldwide who lack access to safe and affordable surgery. I'm Rihanna. And I'm Taylor. And together we're Global Scalpels. Welcome, everyone, to our first episode of Global Scalpels. We're very excited to have you here with us today and to finally launch this new global surgery podcast that we've been working on. We hope that it's something that's very accessible for you and aids in bringing together people from all different aspects of global surgery. And that means from tech to businessmen and women and from nurses to administrators, we really hope that this podcast is for everyone and that everyone can get involved. We recorded this episode months ago, but the episode today seems even more relevant given the heartbreaking events that have occurred with George Floyd and the resulting political unrest. We at Global Scalpels stand in solidarity with the communities who are fighting for cessation of systemic racism and the current Black Lives Movement. And we feel that no one should be discriminated against for the color of their skin, their sexual orientation, gender, or even the situation that they were born in. And our episode today covers many of these topics, including changing our mentality when it comes to the decolonization of global health, considering healthcare disparities and structural changes that need to occur when we're creating international partnerships and doing education. With that heavy background, I'd like to introduce our amazing speaker today and start into the episode. He is coming to us today from Rider Trauma Center in Miami, Florida, as well as his day job as a trauma and critical care surgeon. He also sits on the board of medical advisors for the largest NGO that provides medical education in the Kurdish-controlled region of Iraq. His impressive resume includes previous advisory work to the United Nations, advocacy and political work with NGOs in Haiti and India, teaching about global health and humanitarian responses at the university level, as well as conducting training at various agencies from the U.S. Air Force to the Special Operations Surgical Team and the White House Medical Unit. So with that, we're very excited to have him with us here today. So we'd like to warmly welcome Rishi Ratan to our show. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So we'll start off by just speaking a little bit about your career. And you've held a number of impressive positions in a number of organizations. But one aspect that seems to be really common amongst all of them is medical education. Can you tell us about your journey from being a student yourself to being a medical educator? Yeah, actually, it's been um, a little interesting. And thank you for your description of that. Um, it's been, I, it feels for me, a, a, a bit of a longer journey or realization um, about the importance of education and global health. If you, uh, or for, for those of your listeners that are a little bit on the younger side, you know, when I was in medical school, there was very little structurally or educationally about global health as a career and almost the sort of like the pedagogy of global health. How does one think about doing it in a way that is sustainable and ethical? That stuff was just sort of coming out um, in a broader way. You know, for example, Paul Farmer had been writing about that for ages before that point, but, um, you know, he was quite novel. Partners in Health, I think, got its, um, you know, part of the reason that it got its name and the, the reason Paul Farmer, has in his, his writing in medical anthropology, got its name uh, was because of uh, how novel the approach was compared to prior global health, or particularly in surgery. It was a lot of mission work and then sort of blitz surgery where you go for a week, operate on as many people as you can, et cetera. So that was really sort of my introduction to global health. And... Um, as I sort of progressed or evolved in my work and became uh, increasingly disillusioned with the effects of what I was doing, that really sort of pushed me uh, to read about the ethics of global health, the difference between humanitarianism and development work, how that can be applied to global surgery as I started leaning towards surgery. I, I kind of came late to the game in terms of my interest in surgery. All of those things, again, sort of led me to really think critically about what I was doing, what the effects were, and and really sort of hold space for how I was feeling. And, and not necessarily all was good, but those situations in which I felt bad about what I was doing Again, for the audience who's been involved in global health, it's almost this kind of trope when you're debriefing. Tell me about a situation where you were asked to do something out of your scope of practice. And, and that struggle of like, well, it's better than nothing versus, well, this is really unethical. I would never treat someone in my home institution or home country like that. And so I, as I tried to address that within myself, I really I got introduced from peers and, and other role models and mentors um, to the concept of really focusing on education. It really resonated with me to be able to not bring my own skills into an, uh, an area that was alien to me, basically. I didn't know the culture. I didn't speak the language. I didn't live there. Um, there was a lot of subtlety beyond being able just to communicate with language 
uh, or just be able to understand the, the superficial aspects of culture to really deeply understanding the community that I was trying to help. And it almost seemed like an impossible task unless I plan to commit my entire life there the way sometimes people do when they're in a diaspora situation. So from that, I realized, well, what is the skill I really have? It's not necessarily surgery alone. The things that I have been acquiring through surgical training, uh, where the trope in the U.S. is often see one, do one, teach one. Well, a third of that is about teaching. And um, so that's really been where that interest in medical education came from, realizing that I have a skill other than technical skill. And actually, the technical aspect of surgery is often not the most premier or, or most unique skill set, I think, of a physician. Oftentimes, it's that ability to teach others, particularly if you're pursuing academic surgery. And so I focused and, or shifted my focus to that aspect of the things I do in my career between research, education, and clinical work. Do you think um, that the education and that, you know, mentorship that you're talking about is what brought you, you said you came late to the to the game of, of surgery. So is that kind of what brought you in? Is this education component that you were being taught by other people around you that got you interested? Or what was it that brought you to surgery as an, an interest, I guess? So specifically for surgery, it's kind of interesting. I, uh, I chose to do my surgery clerkship first in our, our, our clinical years, you know, that's the third year for in, in the US system. And uh, I did it first because I wanted to get it out of the way because I figured I could do, I knew that I could do anything, but I definitely didn't want to do surgery and it was difficult. <laughs> so I just wanted to be done with it. Famous and, off words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so I did it. I really enjoyed it, but I figured that was because I enjoyed being in the hospital for the very first time as, as my first taste of clinical work. And so, you know, they gave me the usual line, oh, you know, you should consider surgery. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Uh, bye. <laughs> so you guys never. Uh, and then by the end of the year, I uh, realized that the things that I thought that I wanted to do because that's how I wanted to make a difference were things that I actually wasn't interested in clinically. So um, you know, Joya Mukherjee, who's also part of Partners in Health, she's one of my mentors. And I remember talking with her early on and, and saying, you know, I really feel like I should be do med peds and then an ID fellowship just so I can be like you guys and, and do global health and, and how, what's the best way to go about that? And, uh, in, in her, in her classic sort of tough love way, um, was basically <laughs> like, you're, you're being an idiot. You know, that's not how you go about deciding how to, how to lead your life. You need mm. to do what you're passionate about and what you love, and then everything else will sort of fall into place. So you have this passion for advocacy and global health that will fall into place. Like no matter what you do, you're, you're going to, the arc is going to bend towards that. So when you're choosing a specialty, you should choose a specialty in the same way. And so I was thinking, well, I don't really like much of anything. People around me were sort of telling me, well, I don't know, Rishi, you seemed really happy on the surgery rotation. I was like, no, that doesn't make sense. That's not primary care. That's not the way that I think global health should happen. That's a specialty. Like we need to do, uh, you know, uh, have community medical education and vaccines and community health workers and none of that is surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when I really thought about it, um, I realized that, that what I love deep down was surgery. I didn't like scrubbing for eight hour cases to hold and retract. Mm -hmm. I would fall asleep and get yelled at. <laughs> I, I didn't like anatomy lab. I skipped anatomy lab in medical school because I didn't like it. And so I had to relearn all my anatomy as a third and fourth year because I never really learned it that well. I'm definitely not a morning person. Um, I don't particularly like the surgical personality, but you know what? None of that is actually the act of doing surgery and the, the act of treating surgical disease. And actually those two things I love an incredible amount. And so once I stripped away all the tropes and stereotypes and what people said it means if you're if you like surgery or not, and just focused on what I love, um, surgery became the obvious choice. And it was almost like I didn't have to think through it. I just followed my gut. And so, in addition to the technical aspect, you know, I really like ICU. I like um, the the concept of end of life care and the idea of us as physicians not just saving lives, but being there for the whole circle of life, the, the whole cycle of life and that that part of life is death and being an advocate and bearing witness and providing dignity through all aspects of life, including those moments that patients are really scared um, or that they face their mortality or that their family faces the mortality, I think is a really important part of medicine that we don't always focus on, uh, particularly in, in a very sort of structured medical school system like the U.S. Is, can sometimes be. Um, so those two aspects um, about end of life and, and death with dignity as well as the uh, surgical aspect really are what drew me to surgery. Wow, I think it's really amazing to hear, hear you kind of redefine what it means to be a surgeon and all these things that, you know, 50 years ago, if you, you wouldn't equate the two with surgery. 
Um, and hopefully for people coming through nowadays, when surgery is seen as a huge part of, it, of a country's healthcare infrastructure, maybe that is more in the forefront of their mind. But it's great that people like you are kind of redefining that. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's also been redefined by my peers and, and going to the surgical conferences nowadays and hearing people talk about what's important to them in surgery, or just even looking at the papers coming out of, say, JAMA surgery, and it's talking about um, gender inequity and discrimination and implicit bias and, and how we can be uh, better train our trainees, how we prevent burnout. I think the whole field is really shifting because the people who have those ideas are now coming into positions of power. And those folks are, you know, maybe seven, 10 years ahead of me. Um, and they're who I look up to and, and who I really think are the trailblazers. But, you know, it's interesting, like one of the tropes about surgery versus medicine is medicine likes to talk to their patients and we like our <laughs> patients to sleep. But um, <laughs> it, it's really the, the challenge. I think what really draws me, particularly to trauma and acute care surgery, is the challenge, and ICU, is the challenge of building that patient-physician relationship under really stressful, harsh conditions. If I'm a medicine doctor uh, or family medicine, my experience with that, you know, I've never done it. I've just rotated through it. But my experience was that that was like a, a rich and nurtured and in-depth uh, relationship that was built up over time. And that was through many episodes of building trust. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, but it was something that was just a, I, I personally struggled for, but it was amazing to watch someone deliver a child and then take care of that child and watch that child go off to college or whatever it is. But in surgery, I'm meeting people often on the worst day of their life. And I have seconds to walk into that room and establish trust and uh, establish a bond and a relationship where they can trust me when often, especially in trauma, I don't have all the information. So they'll ask questions and a lot of my answers are going to be, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what we're going to find. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know if he's going to make it or she's going to make it. And then in that area of uncertainty and newness and I'm a stranger, being able to navigate that in a way that provides dignity and, and uh, assurance and um, a connection, a human connection to provide comfort, I think is, is a, it's a unique challenge. And it's one that I really love trying to address every day. It's so inspiring. It's, it's great to hear. I mean, ch challenges are going to come in so many different forms, right? Whether they're in COVID and this whole thing, if it's in training, if it's in disaster relief, as we'll talk about later, or if it's in the worst day of someone's life and you're coming in with limited information. Obviously, we, as we talked about in your inter introduction and in your bio that you have done a lot of different things outside of medicine as well. And you currently sit on the board of one of the largest NGOs that provides clinical and medical education in Kurdish controlled Iraq. On this theme of challenges, what are some of the challenges that you have found while delivering medical education in that setting specifically? Yeah, you know, I think it's a very, very challenging and complex situation. And it's one that I have tried to be very thoughtful about my role. Um, and so it tends to be a limited role, even though I sit on the board. Um, you know, initially, uh, first the, the organization kind of courted me for like, I think two years before I <laughs> even said, yes, I'm, I'm willing to do this. And then even once I've said yes, the involvement has been very focused on what I think is, can be an ethical involvement. I think first of all, um, the, the clinical infrastructure there can be potentially very different. It's surprisingly not as different as we would expect. Um, we are working there with cardiothoracic surgeons and, and in the ICU and doing major surgery and orthopedic surgery. They're doing major reconstructions. A lot of that is through funding um, through the U.S. and other international organizations that have a vested political interest in creating stability in that region. That's Kurdish and not, you know, Iraqi. But, um, but you know, that in and of itself doesn't mean that the entire health system is as mature as we are used to. So when we talk about pre-hospital stuff, especially from a trauma perspective, and the training or existence of paramedics, um, EMS, pre-hospital care in general, um, transportation, all of that is very limited and uh, is an area of and an opportunity to invest in the system and help train people. But infrastructure is not there. So it's not just a matter of having clinical experts going and saying, this is how you do pre-hospital assessment and resuscitation. We also need experts who, are say, who can tell us, this is how you build a pre-hospital system. This is how you start it, start from the ground up, which is a completely different skill set than a clinician has. Certainly, there may be some academic clinicians that that invest in their own education on systems management and systems infrastructure. But just by the virtue of me doing some pre-hospital care, does not make me an expert. So the a multidisciplinary approach we have to have in a in a low 
lower infrastructure place is definitely much more complex. And then you add on top of that, there are the cultural differences. You know, that's also something to bridge in terms of, you know, what who sometimes people are willing to listen to or not, or where the information's coming from, how it's coming from, how the cultures interact. Um, you know, obviously there's sometimes a lot of differences between different cultures in general, in terms of gender, et cetera. You know, if their supervisor is a woman, that can sometimes create strains or stressors. Is that something that we want to tackle head on? Or do we want to uh, be understanding of it? You know, that's, that's not something that's always a black and white answer. And, uh, you know, that goes for a lot of things uh, when you're dealing with another culture. Then there's the social context as well. So, right, you know, when we first started doing work there, they were, uh, it was a conflict zone. There were combatants. We were getting Peshmerga militants who had been injured. Um, you know, we were doing mobile clinics near where IEDs went off routinely and affected civilians. Um, we've even take, taken care of some U.S. military service members because we were closer than their field hospital. Wow. And that is a very fraught context that not necessarily everybody who's interested in he- doing humanitarian work is um, prepared or capable of doing, nor do they necessarily want to. You know, there's, there's a difference between working in an austere setting and working in a combat setting. Even if you're removed from the combat, we were fairly well protected. We've never had any injuries or any even threat of injury um, and have multiple layers of security. We have security personnel on our board, but still it's a different situation and there's a different level of how you address a patient's needs. It's easy, I think, even here in trauma in the U.S., even though we shouldn't be doing it like this, to forget about the psychological aspect of what a patient is experiencing and how that relates to their trauma. That sort of falls under the larger umbrella of what's, what, what surgery or rather trauma is trying to borrow from the mental health fields and learn from our mental health colleagues about trauma-informed care. Um, and we're trying to do that, but that's almost an, a, an essential aspect of providing care in a war zone is understanding uh, the manifestations of how that patient is experiencing trauma and how that presents in them, both psychologically and physiologically. And I think that's really critical if you're going to try to provide care, not to just patch up bullet holes, but to provide that support. And then, uh, you know, finally, it's the political context. I don't pretend to be an expert about what's going on there. You know, no matter what you do, and how neutral you try to be, someone there in that context is going to feel like you're picking a side. Um, And that's, you know, if you look at the history of uh, humanitarian work, that's sort of where MSF, um, you know, Doctors Without Borders broke off from, from organizations like IRC and ICRC is because of that feeling of, well, neutrality is not actually neutral. Neutrality uh, leans towards supporting the status quo or whoever's in power, no matter how oppressive they may be. And so we need mm-hmm. to take a stand. We need to do something. And, and we need to know that by doing nothing, silence sometimes still signals picking a side. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, that's not to say it's easy to navigate. MSF has had their own issues navigating that. I don't think that there's a perfect answer. But certainly when you're going into a politically fraught situation, you have to acknowledge the complexity of and the optics of what you're doing and for which part of the community. It's great to hear such a nuanced approach to how to approach uh, this whole education initiative that you guys have in, in this part of Iraq. I mean, you talk about team and culture and environment and all these things that people wouldn't necessarily think of and probably aren't necessarily the same in every global surgery setting. How have you taken these things into account when designing your initiative? Yeah, so that's that's also a good question. And and so, you know, I, I will say that I've come on as a board member of this organization, so it's not my initiative. So I, what I, the reason I was brought on was because of to offer that perspective. And so um, I sort of offer in a consulting role. But what that has meant for, for me in some of my other NGO work that I've been more involved in the leadership of that, you know, of organizations I've helped found is that, uh, and sometimes I've learned it on the job, so to speak, or through the process of going through it, is that sometimes less is more. And it really has led me to introspect about the reasons I'm doing the work that I'm doing and really try to pay attention and listen to the effects that my work is having and realizing that sometimes that means even if it feels like I'm doing good work, the right thing to do is to sort, to sort of take a step back a little and focus inward or focus on myself or focus on where, where the power actually is and where I have access to power. And so examples of that, I think Haiti's a good example of that. When I first started working Haiti, in Haiti in 2007, it was purely clinical. And um, I very quickly developed a lot of mixed feelings about what I was doing. Um, there were a lot of situations in which I felt like I was out of my range and over my head, in over my head. And it left really sort of uh, a bad taste in my mouth uh, because I caused harm. 
for sure. Yeah, I helped some people. But if I'm really honest with myself, I also caused some harm due to my lack of education and lack of skills and trying to, quote unquote, do what's right. And so I shifted from from clinical to political advocacy. Because what I felt was like, what's happening here is that I'm not actually providing the best clinical care I can. Even when I was an attending, I still don't, as, as a faculty member, fully trained and doing training for other people, I still sort of resist doing purely clinical work unless I, I'm uh, being accompanied by or under the supervision of a Haitian surgeon. They don't have to be senior to me. But by the very nature of the fact that they're a Haitian surgeon operating in Haiti, I think that gives them uh, a supervisory role to me. And so I'm happy to help out with them or if they want to double scrub or if they say, you know, can you help work some shifts uh, in the hospital while you're here? And, you know, I'm, I'm around if you need me or whatever. That's a lot more palatable to me ethically for my own personal ethics um, than my previous work has been. And so during when the Haiti um, earthquake happened, we were really sort of um, trying to think about how we can clinically help. Uh, our colleagues, we had started an organization with uh, Haitian medical students. So it was like med student to med student, resident to resident, how can we help? And we were thinking, you know, we'll get IV bags and, and splints and ACE bandages and everything. And they were like, no, we just want books. And we're like, what? This is insane. This is crazy. They're like, listen, we have lived through so much disaster in our lifetime. We don't need help living through disaster. We're trying to become physicians because we want to help people. And I go to a school that is using a book from the 1970s. And I know, I know that there's better information out there. And it kills me that I don't have access to that information to be able to help the people that I really want to help. And it totally blew us away that even in the midst of a disaster, what they really wanted to focus on was their own education as a tool for agency um, to help the, help their community. And that was really sort of a wake up call for us. And we started the medical education organization um, then and really just sort of listened it was a lot of listening. And oftentimes they told us things that we did not want to hear and did not want to do. Um, you know, we want to lecture on this topic. We want you to help us get, you know, we were like, oh, you know, we're in the U.S. We have all this access to technology. We should do webinars. And they were like, yeah, no, that's, that's not, we don't want a webinar. Like, yeah, I may go WhatsApp with my friends or something, but that's not going to work in rural Haiti. And that's, that's, they're like, okay, but we, you know, we'd come back with like, oh, but we, you know, we have friends at Harvard. They could do this for free. We can make it CME. They're like, we don't care about CME. Like we want something that we can access day or night from from our pocket with or without electricity, like, you know, this or that. And then we're like, okay, well, I guess we're just going to have to like make PowerPoints and mail you books. That doesn't really involve us going to Haiti, which was part of the fun of it, you know, and, and, and so it really allowed us to navigate pathway led by them and, and them telling us what, what they needed and listening to that and, and trusting them to know their own needs which I think sometimes can be a hard thing to do when, when the situations are very different, when you have a lot of resources or a particular set of resources, every hammer looks like a nail. I was doing political advocacy there as well. And um, while I was getting the changes that I wanted uh, on a big level that felt bigger than anything I'd done before at the UN Security Council or through the Department of Peacekeeping Operations or the U.S. State Department, it really like it, in, the, in the moment, it really felt like I was doing important work because I was doing something on a scale I'd never experienced as a physician, let alone someone in an NGO. But as I really listened to the secondary effects of what I was doing, it became really clear to me that the bigger scale you go, the more unintended consequences you have. And that while if I just sort of looked at what I did, I could say, yeah, this was good work. I am working to help the UN admit that they started the cholera epidemic in Haiti and then covered it up. That is good work. But the ways in which I was able to get that admission, how does that affect people on the ground in Haiti? And realizing that not everybody was happy with my methods, even though the end goal may be the same. That was also really sobering because it's, it's almost like that battle is not my battle. I, I took it on as my battle. It's, a, it's their battle and I want to help. And uh, if I can't really show them and show myself that I'm helping, then that, that's really a problem. And so that made me focus my work less on Haiti and more on the U.S. side of things and uh, helping get them access po to power, amplifying their voice rather than creating my own voice. You know, we think about activism as giving a voice to the voiceless. The reality is that they're not voiceless. They have a voice. It just needs to be amplified because the people in the halls of power mm -hmm. listening, seeing myself as an amplifier rather than giving voice, um, I think kind of was a shift in how I focused. And you, and you mentioned how, you know, everyone with a hammer sees everything as a nail, but also everyone with a hammer thinks like a builder. And that's kind of what we as surgeons are like. How, what advice would you give to someone who is thinking more along your lines and thinks, how can I use my surgical knowledge to actually go into the political sphere? 
Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a really good question. It's something that I've struggled with as well. And I think it's, it's particularly hard for doctors and within doctors, probably particularly hard for surgeons. But the reality is, is that most of the things that we care about, we are not supposed to be the leaders for that movement. And we are supposed to play a supporting role. It's, I think it's hard, you know, in trauma, we're the captain of the ship. Even if I don't know where I'm going, I don't know what's happening. My job, my skill set is to be able to corral my team and give them a vision and provide some confidence so and provide an ability for others to speak up and and add to the richness of the voice and stuff. And um, I think that ability to create a space for others to speak, to add to the richness of care or to think of something that you weren't thinking about is really the skill at least as a trauma surgeon, that I use the most now in my advocacy and activism and even global health work. It's not the surgical skill, you know, and it's not the leading it and being the face of the the movement or the front runner of that movement. It's realizing that if I'm talking about gun violence in my backyard, um, you know, in the communities next to Ryder Trauma Center and about um, young black men getting shot in those neighborhoods, that I can be a voice that helps, that helps add to the discussion and enrich the discussion. I can be an amplifier because someone's, you know, in Tallahassee, uh, or the capital, you know, is more likely to answer the phone from a doctor than, you know, some, um, poor black community leader. But the reality is, is that that's their community. That's their fight. And, and they know what they need. And rather than going in with saying, Hey, I'm going to help you solve this problem because it really, really bothers me going in and saying, Hey, this problem really, really bothers me. It, it makes me lose sleep at night. How can I help? That must be even harder for you. Mm-hmm. That must be, you know, I, I can't imagine what it's like to see your children uh, dropping like flies. What can I do to help you? And approaching problems like that, I think will start a very different conversation if you persist in that viewpoint. Very often people come in and they're like, okay, well, I'm then going to do a needs assessment. And then it morphs into telling you, here are my findings. Here's what you need to do. But it's really kind of keeping that or, or sort of trying to like push back that hubris of, of saying, I'm a leader in my field or in my job so I can lead this situation and realizing that we probably need to be doing more listening. As you said, it's that's kind of hard for us to do sometimes as surgeons, right? We <laughs> kind of want to just do rather than sit back and, and take the more listening role. So I think you've hit on some very, very interesting and important points. I would like to circle back to one thing that you mentioned earlier. You said one of your points was that we need to have more multidisciplinary teams and we need to be thinking not just a surgeon or just this, but thinking more broadly. So do you think that, I, th- I think there's a movement for that in the States as well, right? You kind of have a, a patient and you have the respiratory team and this team and this team and all these different teams are coming together to manage the patient um, and they're all experts in their fields. How do you think those teams are different maybe in a low resource setting or even a disaster setting than perhaps what we think about them in the state? That's a, that's a good question. And I think, um, I think that that's what the, uh, it, it's almost, I'm going to try to channel Joya uh, in giving my response because I, I had, see so many med students and residents saying, what kind of doctor do I need to be? Uh, sorry, rather undergraduate students before they've chosen medicine, people who find these topics interesting, they would often ask me, what kind of doctor should I be? And uh, I think the reality is that the doctor is the last person you need in responding to global health problems. Doctors treat disease. We are a tiny slice of public health. And we're, we're a post hoc intervention. It's after you've gotten the disease uh, that we sort of step in and say, oh, hey, what can I do now that the now that there's a dumpster fire? How do I put it out? But in reality, <laughs> we don't want we don't want these dumpster fires. Right. And so we need engineers. We need builders. We need uh, business people. We need people who understand systems and structures. We need water and sanitation people. Like if you're if if I was so, you know, so many times in responding to the cholera epidemic in Haiti and trying to do advocacy for that, I experienced such extreme frustration because I wasn't a water and sanitation specialist. And all I thought was like, if I could just give up all the resources I was putting into getting me to Haiti or talking to the government of Haiti or trying to set up a meeting between Haiti and the UN or Haiti and the US and just give that over to a water and sanitation specialist, I wish I would do that. I wish I could do that. I would do that in a second. So when we look at global health, the most common killer are respiratory diseases and, and waterborne illness, you know, diarrheal diseases. So that, to me, none of those solutions involve a doctor. And in fact, a lot of those solutions only sort of, per, not peripherally, but they only sort of partially involve public health as part of a larger goal of things like environmental health, environmental justice, um, legal advocacy for people, international trading policy, 
and you know water and sanitation as i mentioned you know water engineering sustainable um resources and and uh, power and things like that like hydroelectric jams or solar there's so many things that go into creating clean water making sure that a factory is not polluting in an under uh, resourced community that i i think that those are the things that are really important and that extends beyond just like the you know stem fields um so much of if you look at major social movements particularly from the 1960s onwards they're often trying to address a problem that people feel but they can't verbalize quite yet there's not the vocabulary for it that's part of the reason that it's considered oppression or some sort of ism is because they don't even have a language for it yet because the main, the status quo doesn't recognize that issue and so if you look at say the 60s and the 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 counterculture and all those revolutions and women's rights and uh critical race theory and everything over there lgbt issues if you go back 10 years before that or 20 years before that it was the poets and philosophers and before even people with words it was the artists who were who were painting about this that led to this idea of existentialism and absurdism that led to the birth of of you know identity politics in the 60s so whether you choose art or you choose water and sanitation or you choose medicine you have a role if that's your passion you have a role in in amplifying voices and and quantifying and characterizing those voices and it's i've seen poets and artists and philosophers do that as if not more powerfully than public health experts in certain situations. Yeah, I mean, I think we just really need to challenge our paradigm of thinking of what is public health and what is or global health or even global surgery, right? We think it's very surgeon centric, but as you said, like perhaps the person who's like most important in that thing is the person who's sterilizing the equipment, right? Or like maybe that's the person that is actually the most important person rather than the surgeon or something. And in, in full disclosure, I mean, I'm interested in that as a joint degree student who's currently getting an uh, MBA, because I saw that same need in some of the systems that I was working in, that a lot of the issues I was seeing were not clinical at all. They were administrative issues, as you pointed out, or water sanitation issues or whatever that the you know administration wasn't aware of or didn't know about because they maybe didn't have the clinical background to see that as a problem. So it's that liaison between you know the medical expertise. As you said, we, maybe we don't need a doctor for that, but we do need the doctor to identify the problem. And then we need to exactly. pass it on to someone else to, who has the expertise of the water sanitation or the finance or whatever it is to get that job done. But it maybe isn't the role of the doctor to do so rather than identify. Beautifully said. Very, very interesting. I mean, this is an amazing conversation so far and we're very grateful for your thoughts and things that you brought up. We want to go a little bit into another part of your specialty that you know a lot about and your expertise of disaster management. Just kind of start off with what is the biggest disaster relief that you maybe have had an opportunity to be a part of? That's, um, that's a good question. So, you know, in one way or another, I've helped out uh, after the Haiti earthquake and cholera epidemic and, uh, you know, obviously helping here with this COVID pandemic. I haven't had too much other experience in terms of boots on the ground with, uh, you know, like a big disaster. Um, I've done a lot more uh, mass casualty work. So, for example, if I was in India, um, you know, I don't know that it would have even made national headlines in India. But for our community, you know, there was a forest fire that raged through and uh, burned down an entire village. Um, and that sort of totally overwhelmed the health system in the region. Um, and so managing that, uh, you know, I don't know that I would call that a disaster on the level of a national or international disaster. But it was certainly a mass casualty uh, incident that on a smaller scale definitely has all the same flavors and concepts and fundamentals. The Boston Marathon bombings, I was on trauma call uh, the day of the Boston Marathon bombings and, uh, you know, essentially worked a 40 hour shift doing trauma and treating all the patients that came in. We were the hospital closest to where the bombs went off. You know, that's like another mass casualty incident. And each one has a has a different aspect to it. You know, there was obviously the terrorism aspect of that adds, you know, a unique flavor to it. But in Haiti, you know, we often, I worked on the mountains where the roads were often unpaved. So during the rains, uh, they would sometimes become impassable. But, um, you know, people would travel in large trucks in big groups. And so we had a situation where two trucks collided. Um, it was about 80 people injured. And our ER and our, we were the rural district hospital. We were like the big hospital in the area. Uh, we had one ER bed and no blood no surgeons, uh, one ultrasound machine. Um, and then we had all of a sudden 80 patients. So, um, you know, again, I, I don't know the 
best way to define disaster, but all of those um, clearly fall within mass casualty incidents. And I, I think that um, what's happening in New York 100% falls within that because it's by definition, the resources are overwhelmed. Yeah, it sounds like you've, you've had a lot of experience in that side of things. So perhaps the question we don't need to be asking if it's disaster relief, but rather mass casualty. Um, and I think for a lot of people who will be listening to this podcast, they'll be at different stages of their career. Should trainees be helping out in these situations? Are we learning more than we're giving? Um, and if so, what could be the role of them in, in these sort of situations? Yeah, that's a really good question because um, that almost always comes up in every mass casualty incident that I've worked in, um, whether it's disaster focused, like responding to a hurricane um, or forest fire, or it's a, you know, a big event like COVID or, or the Boston Marathon bombings. People want to help. And so they want, they want, they are willing to work outside their scope practice to do that. And I think that it's a very, it's fraught with a lot of problems. And so I would encourage people to not go running into the bur burning building. Almost always, it creates more problems than it helps. And it also potentially endangers that person, um, which creates more people that we that the, the incident response team has to manage. Um, I think that there are ways that this can change. So Italy and New York have been fantastic examples of how you have tiered responses to a mass casualty incident. So um, Italy at all costs, New York at all costs, try to get students out of an area where they would be exposed. But believe me, they were very busy. And Italy sort of role modeled this, role modeled this for us uh, in the U.S. But all the other folks who were working shifts or all of a sudden their child care ended because all the daycares closed down. So medical students started working to support the frontline workers and they were absolutely 100% essential. They were answering phones for clinics that had been closed down. They were doing uh, phone calls to patients and following up with them either on FaceTime or, hey, send me a text message of your wound. So they were doing clinical outpatient care basically over the phone and telemedicine. Uh, they were helping provide food uh, for people who didn't have access to any or helping do child care. Um, they were still doing their own learning. Um, and then, you know, as too many people, too many frontline workers in Italy got sick, then they called up the next line, you know, then they started using residents um, more on the front lines. We, we have remained able to keep the residents relatively out of the front line in Miami, not so much so in New York, but in Italy, and especially sort of in the northern areas, um, they really had to call up on their residents. And so then the next, you know, so then the med medical students moved up. And so then they started doing sort of supervised patient care in sort of low exposure areas but that were still urgent, you know, things like cancer care, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it's not that there isn't a need. It's that there, there needs to be very structured response. And one of the things that's really important in a critical incident is having a very clear hierarchy. And it sort of goes against everything that we think about in how to improve things about trauma care and global health and consensus building. And th that all goes out the window in an emergency. There is one leader and you guys need to listen to him or her. And we need to follow that. And obviously, there needs to be a two way street of communication to you know help problem solve, but they people need to sort of all fall under will and be willing to fall on all under one leader. And you know, in the Boston bombings, I was taking care of trauma patients as much as I could. And then when trauma patients started overwhelming my ability and my trauma team to take care of them, I found med students and oftentimes they were just sort of standing there waiting because they knew they had been told stay out of the way. But they also knew that they might be needed. So they were staying out of the way and they weren't doing anything, which feels incredibly difficult in the middle of a disaster. People are running around, people are coming in screaming, mm -hmm. um, you know, people had were coming in with partial amputations, mangled extremities. Uh, it was a very, you know, and, and to just stand there is extremely hard, but they did. And then when they were called up and, they were, and I was like, hey, listen, this person is not dying but they have these lacerations that you need to fix. And there wasn't always the time to be like, hey, do you know how to fix a laceration? Have you done that before? Um, so that was that kind of coming, rising to the challenge uh, because the standard of care goes out in a mass casualty incident. Um, I mean, that's sort of, again, also the definition. You're not able to maintain the standard of care. So there's a little bit different ethical approach to a low resource thing that might be development related versus a low resource issue that's humanitarian or combat or, or you know terrorist incident disaster related but in those situations there's not really as much of an ethical problem because that because our system is overwhelmed we need them to figure out how to suture uh, on the go um, and there certainly were instances like that I could tell I, they were like you know I, I I've only really done it on a on a simulator and I was like okay well just take your time if you need help like see someone who's not busy holler for help but you're on your own and I know you can do this and they were again critical members of the 
the mass casualty response, but it didn't mean that they were the front of it. Yeah, I mean, the team, there's a lot of members of a team when you're doing this, right? And so they, they're, well, I guess what you're trying to say is there's, there's a role for everyone in different things, but you might need to, you know, take on a different role than maybe you're used to. Um, and I think even, even that goes for surgeons or wherever you are in your level of training, you might be doing things that are outside your comfort zone or what you might normally do, but just to be following the lead of those who are there. And, you know, many people come together to help in a disaster. So can you talk about some of the other players? We've been talking mostly about clinical players, but can you talk about some of the other players, NGOs, government, philanthropists, other people who are also coming together to help in a disaster and how you can best work with them. We talked a little bit about advocacy and besides medical skills, what other skills are really necessary to coordinating a a disaster relief initiative like this? Absolutely. And I think um, I'll, I guess maybe take a little bit of issue with, I think that your phrasing of the question was idealistic. Um, (laughs) I don't, I think that one of the biggest complaints in once the dust settles and looking back on disaster response is very often people didn't come together to respond to a disaster. And there were lots of silos or lots of duplications of, uh, of work and a redundancy that didn't need to be there. And so I think like the really big thing on a big scale that needs to be better with disaster response is that coordination for efficiency. And I think that it's going to be really hard uh, with NGOs and private philanthropists because everybody sort of wants a piece of the pie and everybody thinks that they can do it better than the other organization. So people should follow their lead. People should donate to them. And it's not that sort of single hierarchical structure or organogram. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with dis- disaster response these days. That said, um, absolutely NGOs and uh, sort of private sector people uh, are essential to a lot of disaster response. Because I think that the biggest thing about disaster response is not actually the provision of care, but it's the logistics. It's the, it's the supply chain. It's the being able to get something from point A to point B when, when all the airports are shut down, when you don't have a plane or when you have a plane, but how do you get, you know, fit enough stuff in it? Or how do you get the stuff to the plane when it's a plane size, you know, amount of supplies? You can't just put that on a truck. What if the roads are closed? Um, you know, in a disaster area like earthquake, like the Pakistan earthquake, you know, how do you get something out there? Okay, we can use helicopters. All right. So but where do you get all the helicopters? How do you so you can use military helicopters, but they're using it for their logistics. So how do you nationalize the use of all the tourist helicopters in Pakistan for use of a disaster response? So I think all and and every point of that um, logistics side, or supply side or transportation side, um, is really complex. I mean, people have PhDs in sort of industrial engineering and system science, and they, you know, we still don't have this figured out. But, you know, that involves packers, purchasers, importers, exporters, um, you know, administrators, people who are savvy with business, computer scientists, people who do math and, and know algorithms for like the best efficiency, you know, business leaders, uh, people who have the connections, so like diplomats and lobbyists, and, you know, people who work at a consulate or whatever who can uh, in a foreign country, be able to connect people who need the supplies, hospital administrators, government leaders, all of those people sort of uh, play a really critical role. And I think that the logistics side is a lot more complex and requires a lot more resources than the actual face-to-face person side. There's a lot of systems, you know, thinking that comes into this and a lot of issues as we were talking about earlier with, you know, what does a healthcare system or a healthcare team look like? And it includes, you know, water management or whatever. It's these other logistical issues that we don't think about in a high resource country, right? I don't think about how, I mean, COVID has kind of exposed some of those, like, where are we going to get the masks? Like, how do we get that? Like, we were kind of put into that situation and you saw this mass chaos of, we don't have PPE. What do we do? Like, our supply chain is, uh, is broken, but in a lot of these low resource settings that we're that we're trying to to help in, like the fact of the matter is, like you said, like the roads aren't good, right? It's it's not that they can't get the stuff; it's that they can, but it just takes four times as long because the road is, you know, a dirt path, and they have to get on a bus that you know goes and stops every two seconds instead of you know getting in their private car and just driving the fifteen kilometers, right? So it becomes a very very different issue. Yeah, you know, a good example of that is. Um, so in Haiti now, I occasionally uh, go to Port-au-Prince and, and uh, Mibale, which is in the central plateau, to do teaching. And my teaching of an ultrasound course is example fast, 
uh, the fast exam and trauma is completely different. Um, I, you know, 100% of my teaching of ultrasound in, uh, for trauma or surgery residents and stuff is clinical focused. It's how you do the fast on the person and get the views. I would say that's about, uh, 20% of my teaching in Haiti. 80% of my teaching in Haiti is how do you uh, fix a broken ultrasound machine? How do you know when the ultrasound machine is broken, mm -hmm. right? Because you hear that story over and over and over again. Someone donated an x-ray machine. Someone donated an ultrasound. Someone donated a, a CT scan. And that's all well and good and it seems phenomenal. Someone dated lap uh, donated laparoscopic equipment. And then you go two years later and it's sitting in a corner get gathering dust. And people are like, why? What happened? This is why we can't be giving this, these materials to these people and whatever, whatever people say, you know, as the criticism. But it's just ridiculous because what you're providing is a technology without an ability to maintain that technology. Whether that technology is knowledge about how to do a primary survey or whether it's an ultrasound or whether it's laparoscopic equipment, it's all in a sense technology. And so you have to provide the ability to maintain that technology. And so there's no point in donating an ultrasound machine to Haiti. Um, and get and working on all the trouble of getting it there. If one day someone knocks a couple knobs in the back and now the screen goes black and no one knows how to fix it because it was a donated machine, so it didn't come with an instruction manual, right? So, mm -hmm. so a lot of that work you have to sort of pivot and realizing that you know actually I had to learn to give that lecture, and it took me like the number of hours I had to sit there figuring <laughs> out how to do that. Whereas like actually what they really needed was they needed an ultrasound tech ultrasound tech to to give them that lecture that like the getting the windows is easy that doesn't require a surgeon anybody can do that and an ultrasound tech probably can do it better than a surgeon because they do that all day every day so it's not about getting the the view it's about how to work the machine and mm. uh, you know i wasn't the expert and a lot of what you say about having it locally driven context specific a lot of stuff really resonates with a lot of stuff that's going on nowadays but there's also a lot of stuff that that isn't conforming to that so i think all of that is just really good advice to take on board for anyone who wants to do any work anywhere, uh, really. Um, you've transitioned us on quite nicely to our next session, section, which is looking a bit more about the training that you do. Um, so you train in Haiti, and you've also trained for a lot of other agencies, so the U.S. Army, the White House Medical Unit, just to name a few of those. Can you give us an example and just tell us what training for these institutions actually looks like? Sure, absolutely. It's it's a little bit different for, for every agency. So, for example, the Army Trauma Training Detachment uh, that works with us, we train all the forward surgical teams before they deploy. And the, the concept is that they actually see, even at the height of the Iraq uh, war, uh, they saw more penetrating trauma in Miami than they did in the war. And so they, get, wow. uh, they sort of get a, a run-up and better training that way. And so that is largely clinical, though we also do um, lecture-based. We do simulation-based with them. And then we do cadaver based cadaver tissue training. Um, and that's sort of taking time to go over difficult surgical exposures that they may not see, but that they need to know like the back of their hand to do. We do that with cadavers. And then we actually do a live tissue training, um, which is, is, uh, I think really useful. I am uh, in general against, uh, the use of, or like animal testing and experimentation on animals. But I think, uh, particularly like clinical, like, you know, the way we used to dissect pigs and stuff. I don't know if you guys ever had to do that, but we had to dissect pigs and frogs and sheep. And it's like, I don't know that that's necessarily useful. But in this live tissue training where we use live pigs, I think it's absolutely critical training for our combat surgeons. And so basically what we do is we recreate a field hospital. So we turn the temperature up to like 100 plus degrees Fahrenheit. Oh my um, gosh. <laughs> we have speakers that are um, basically creating background noise, whether that's helicopters or mortar fire at about 100 decibels. So it's really hard to communicate. Uh, because you can't hear what's going on. Um, we bring in pigs and, and we, we uh, basically injure them um, and recreate traumatic injuries, and they have to operate on them and save the pig's life. Um, you know, the pigs are, of course, totally anesthetized to this. They don't feel any pain or anxiety or anything like that. Um, but it really recreates the prob problem of, of what it's like to be in a combat setting and have only, there's no way to train for that to save your, your buddy's life. Um, you know, these are all people going into combat as well. Um, you know, we'll have rotor down wash, so we'll blow dust and flour into the field. Uh, we'll cut electricity in the middle of an operation and cut the lights in the middle of an operation. They'll have to mm -hmm. go through the process of, um, you know, they'll bring in a, a national and they'll operate on the national. The national will have an unexploded ordinance uh, inside them. So it was sort of like a Trojan horse going in and how to how to manage that situation. That's situations I've also done in the field um, with the Swedish Army Special Forces. So I've embedded with them during their military exercises for a week where we have Blackhawks flying overhead and tanks going through the forest and recreating these situations for the Swedish special forces 
um, and how they'll manage under combat if they're under attack in the middle of an operation. If they could save someone if they had 20 minutes, but they don't, and having to let that person die who's wide awake um, and who knows what's going on. Um, so very high stress situations. And, and again, a lot of that isn't knowing the medical answer. A lot of that is team building. Even, in, even with our U.S. Army here at Ryder, when they come through Ryder, a lot of the focus is team building through simulation, yes, but it's really figuring out how that team works together, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, can they identify their own weaknesses and be able to um, manage that in, in a high-stress situation like combat. Similarly, it's a, you know, it's a lot of clinical rotations, so like the White House Medical Unit, the Air Force, um, Surgical Operations, Special Operations Surgical Team, and, and JMAO Joint Medical Augmentation Unit. They're sort of like the Navy SEALs of surgeons. They accompany the Delta Force or Navy SEALs on, on like covert missions. Um, so for example, they were present during uh, the mission against Osama bin Laden, things like that. And so they're there if anybody gets injured or they need to treat the person that they were trying to obtain, things like that. Um, so they tend to be, you know, a very elite force and they're just rotating through. And so I I serve in a supervisory kind of clinical teaching role, uh, you know, for the forward surgical teams or the far forward teams like in Sweden. It's a, it's a lot of kind of live tissue or in the field training where we try to create as, as much of the realistic stress as possible and see how people react and how they work in that. That sounds very intense. Um, yeah. you're, taking, you're taking away their sight. You're giving these incredible sounds around them. And then putting under incredible emotional stress, it must really bring out the best and the worst in people. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's really interesting, and you know, it's it's very different being the instructor. Uh, you know, I was going to the, the Swedish <laughs> woods, and I was you know thinking you know like oh this is really nice, kind of like camping. The sunsets are five <laughs> hours long. You know, the MREs are not that bad. It, it was very cold and wet at night for sure. But you know, I, there were times where if if they made the wrong decision, for example and they were outflanked by the enemy and they had to stay put for 24 hours and we thought we were just going out for two or three hours, um, they were stuck. We were stuck there overnight, 24 hours, cold, wet, without enough equipment. Maybe we didn't have enough any food or we ran out of food the first couple hours because we thought we were just doing a thing. You know, of course, again, for the instructors, they'll come sneak us food and stuff. Um, <laughs> but but for, for the soldiers, yeah. I mean, they were sometimes 24 hours without food and water in the cold and wet um, without proper shelter trying to figure out, okay, well, this is the mistake I made. How do I, how do I get myself out of it? We have someone injured that can't walk. How do we deal with this? We can't use our radios. You know, we don't know where the enemy is. How, how do we navigate this situation? Wow. And, and how, how do you do that? So what, what are the keys to getting these people who are probably incredibly hangry and cold to actually work together? Yeah, so, so just in the same way that trying to address a complex problem like that requires multiple instructors, each uh, kind of squad had multiple instructors. So my uh, role was creating the clinical pressure. And I coordinated with the uh, military folks who were the instructors who were creating the, the situational pressure. So we would, you know, figure out our thing. So I have zero expertise in figuring out how to come up with the right answers in a, in a combat setting about how to navigate all those logistics. But I was all, I was always paired with a, a military instructor. And so you know, I would come up with a clinical scenario and then I go to them and I was like, hey, I want to stress them a little more because they seem like they have a handle on this. I want them to have this other person's buddy come in and, and try to force them to, to operate when they're not operating or tell them that they need to, that their commander is saying, you need guys need to break down your tent and stop treating everyone and move because you're about to be under attack. You have 20 minutes and, you know, breaking down the tent takes 30 minutes when everybody's working together, let alone treating patients. So we, you know, often worked in coordination to create those uh, scenarios. I wish I could just be a fly on the wall. <laughs> I watch this. It just sounds so fascinating to just, you know, watch this. Uh, I, I mean, I think Rihanna brought up a, an interesting point, you know, when you're tired and cold. But I think another component of that is when you have complete strangers who are coming together to work, you know, for a combat, whether that is complete strangers on the same I don't want, don't want to say on the same side, but like maybe from the same culture, but then also cr across cultures, right? You have people if you're in, you know, a foreign place and you're working with locals, you might be working in an interaction where they're complete strangers. So what principles do you guys use in these trainings to promote effective team working among strangers? Yeah, that's really, really important. And that can be extrapolated to any situation. And it's, it's sometimes particularly in a disaster setting, often the higher stress the situation, the more likely you are to be not working with the team that you're aware of. Um, so or that you've known before. So yeah, uh, in that situation, um, I think clear roles and clear expectations are really important to discuss together at the outset, um, if possible. 
that's one of those situations in which consensus building can actually play more of a role before the situation hits you. You know, if it's a hurricane, you have a couple of days trying to figure out who's going to be the A team and B team that are going to be locked down in the hospital. You know, for example, when we respond to hurricanes here in Miami, um, we have an A team and a B team. With the COVID pandemic, we have A, B, C, and D. Um, so who is our team going to be touching base with them, what the roles are going to be? Um, if you hear that, okay, we're getting a medical evacuation. I also do aeromedical transport for disaster management. So a lot of the like evacuating Diamond Princess and evacuating people out of the cruise ship in Yokohama, uh, et cetera. You know, who is your team going to be? And so, and being able to meet and figure out who everyone is, what they're coming to the table with, what they think their strengths are, what they think their potential weaknesses are, and being open and honest about that. And then learn, and having a sense of trying to anticipate needs and how we're going to deal with those things. A lot of that is sometimes imagining situations. How would we deal with that? Who, who would do what? Sometimes you only have a couple seconds to do that. And so you need to, you need to have full buy-in from the team that's willing to participate in that process authentically. And in a way that sometimes can be maybe embarrassing because you feel like you should know how to do something, but you don't. Uh, but it requires that full authenticity, I think, to really make the team succeed. It can be really difficult, but I, I think that it's really, really important. And it doesn't, and it, it sometimes means, for example, with aeromedical transport, it's usually a doctor, maybe like a nurse, uh, critical care nurse, and then, you know, respiratory medic person. So, but it's a three, three people. And you have a critically ill patient. Sometimes they need to be intubated. You need to do procedures on them. You're in the back of a helicopter or in the back of an airplane. Things are moving. You don't have all the equipment you need. Um, you know, everybody's doing something. You're trying to save this person's life. And uh, it can be really, really stressful. And let me tell you, like, it seems obvious to make the doctor the, the leader. I am rarely, rarely, rarely the, the lead of my team because I just don't know enough shit. Like, listen, I know the medical stuff. You think I know how to put an, an IV pump together or like set up the vent? I know now it's part of my training, right? So I can do it, sure. but I can get it done. But really nurse, the nurse can get it all like the nurse or the medic who's used to being out in the field and that's their day job. They're the better leader because they know all the other things. And so very often when we'll talk and we'll say like, listen, I'm good at putting IV pumps together. I can put the vent together. I can do this. I can do that. But here are the things that I'm uncomfortable doing. We'll often come to a situation where, yeah, sometimes I'm the leader, but sometimes it's very clear that we have a strong medic or a strong critical care nurse and, and they're better at being the leader and, and recognizing that that's okay. And that actually is going to be a better outcome for the patient. And that actually makes me feel more comfortable in that situation. I don't really see it as an ego hit. It kind of gives me like a, like I can wipe my brow because like, okay, all the responsibility is not just on me. Like I have help here. I have leadership to look to. Obviously when you're the leader, you don't have that. And, and that's part of the stress of being a leader. But um, certainly in those situations, when you have someone who's there to help you, uh, take full advantage of them. And sometimes that means taking a step back. I think that's come across uh, earlier when you said about the medical students as well. And that sometimes the best thing we can do is actually follow someone else and not have that instinct to go ahead and be the hero in the situation. Um, so I think that's absolutely great. It sounds like you work with an incredible number of organizations. So you've mentioned a few more that we hadn't realized the Swedish army there. One of the questions that we have that kind of links to a lot of the things you've been saying is that how do you actually, when working with organizations, just anyone who's interested in global surgery, how can they convince others that this is an important topic and this is something that we should be investing in and thinking about? Yeah, so I think it depends on who your audience is. But I think in large part, it's making sure you combine meticulous data with authentic personal narratives in a way that demonstrates that um, you are approaching the problem thoughtfully and ethically. You know, the data is really, really important because people don't think, for example, that trauma is that big of a deal. Like if you look at the way funding works, um, trauma causes more death than AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. But there's a global fund for AIDS, TB, and malaria, but there's not a global fund for trauma or a global fund for road traffic injuries, which is one of the major causes of trauma across the world. And so being able to provide that data to say, this is a huge problem that needs to be addressed, I think is really important. You know, there's this talk in global surgery about global surgery as primary care. I think to a lot of people who live in well-resourced areas, that's kind of like hard for them to imagine what that means. Maybe our folks who, who work in rural areas or under-resourced areas in the U.S., of course, that makes total sense to them. But the, the average surgical leader is someone who's in an urban academic environment and next to D.C. or New York or public health schools and all these funders, and maybe they don't quite get that. Um, so you need to take the time to, to prove to them through data that this is actually the situation. And then, uh, you know, people don't just respond to data alone. You need, there, there needs to be some element of social math to that and, and being able to have that personal narrative. And 
the reason that it needs to be authentic is that you need to make sure that you're doing it in a way that it doesn't co-opt someone else's story uh, in a way for, for your own gain. Um, you know, it obviously needs to be done with consent. It needs to be done in a thoughtful and empathetic, compassionate way. Um, but it also needs to be uh, a story that I think that is, is partially yours as well to share. You know, you can't just go like getting stories for people and not explaining what the role and goal is. And, and a lot of stories, for example, a lot of our stories with uh, our, our Haitian organization is stories that, that Haitian medical students that participate in our conferences or trainings want to share themselves. And we'll tell them at the beginning, hey, this is something we do. Here are some examples of your colleagues doing it. If this is something that you want to do, let us know. Um, and, and here's how we'll use it. Here's the purpose of it. Here's how, it, yes, it's going to go to, you know, we're like Americans showing it to other Americans to get money for our organization, but here's where our money goes. And having that two-way street, the same way you do with donors, to have that two-way conversation with, with recipients. I don't know that that is really well built up in NGO work. That, that in the same way we try to meticulously account for every minute and every dollar that we're using to the donor, that we feel that same obligation to the recipient. If anything, that obligation is even greater because that's who we have the, or should have the fiduciary duty to is not the donor, is, is the recipient um, of our work. And then, uh, and then, you know, that, that leads into the ethical aspect of it. We need to be doing work that is a partnership that is sustainable, um, that actually helps people in the way that they need help. And oftentimes we cannot be the deciders of that, let alone a donor. That can make it very complex. But I think that if, if we try to keep those three principles in mind, we will be way ahead of the curve compared to an average NGO. Oh, I think that's amazing. Thank you so much for that. The entire session has just been so great for learning a lot more about what you do and about how you approach the things you do. And I think there are a lot of useful lessons we can take from all of this. For all our podcasts, we always finish them with, with five questions. And the reason we do this is in honor of the five billion people worldwide who don't have access to safe, affordable surgery. So I'll just start off with the first one, which is, what is the most recent book that you've read? Uh, the most recent book I've read is called The Hidden Life of Trees. And it's fantastic and I highly recommend it. We'll, we'll, put, we'll put the link in the description for, yeah. for the readers to be able to, <laughs> <laughs> to hear. Um, the next one is, um, what's something that not very many people know about you or a unique talent of yours? Uh, I don't know that I have many unique talents, but um, not too many people know that uh, I'm a skydiver. Uh, and uh, that's one of my ways I like to both unwind and also be an adrenaline junkie. Is, uh, <laughs> oh, wow. I... <laughs> perfectly good airplanes in my spare time. While you're doing tracheotomies and different things. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fastest way to get to the ground. <laughs> exactly. Um, and number three is, what was your favorite toy growing up and why? Probably my bicycle. Um, I think once I learned to ride, I was like always riding my bike and trying to incorporate my bike into how I played. Because one, I would pretend that it was a plane and that I could be flying, which probably ties into the skydiving interest. Uh, <laughs> and two, it gave me a lot more freedom to go where I wanted to go uh, rather than being stuck in the house. Um, the next one, number four, is uh, how would you spend a million dollars? I'd probably be really, really boring and try to invest most of it so that I could grow it and then use it for other good. But I guess uh, I would probably use it towards the, the medical education work um, that I'm doing. I think that uh, there's a lot of really simple ways in which we can expand that work that a million dollars would be just like a massive amount of money for, um, for books and knowledge, but trying to, ex trying to use it to expand knowledge, I guess, most broadly. Amazing. And You've given us a lot of good advice today, but what's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten? Um, I think the, the, it's sort of a, an amalgam of what people have told me, but um, is to trust your gut at its most pithy. Um, I have spent so much time trying to predict my life two years ahead. Uh, for example, two years after I started clinical rotations, I figured I'd be in anything but surgery. And then I did my surgery residency and I figured I'd do anything but fellowship because I was going to go work in Africa and then I did a trauma fellowship. And in trauma fellowship, I said I'd do anything except academic medicine. And now I'm a professor at a university and do a bunch of research. And, uh, you know, I think there's so much in, in medical people that is uh, type A traits where we really like to weigh the pros and cons and have a logical approach to a decision and have it make sense and know why we're making the decision we're making. And, um, I think we do that at the detriment to our emotional side and uh, trusting our gut. And the minute I started trusting my gut, all these decisions became super easy. I spent like hours and hours and days and weeks agonizing over my rank list, trying to decide where I was going to do residency. 
And then by the time I got to fellowship and had been taught this lesson by a bunch of people that I really respect and admire, uh, it was no stress. I showed up to interviews without notepads. I just sort of went with my gut. And it's been one of the best decisions of my life where I ended up here at Rider Trauma Center, uh, where I now work. Um, but yeah, I just trusted my gut. And it I took about 25 seconds to make the decision to make my rank list and just went with it. And uh, it turned out great. So I guess that would be my piece of advice. Fantastic. It sounds like you've done well on the back of that as well. So <laughs> <laughs> um, thank to. you. Thank you so much for taking this time to share all of your experiences and answer all of the questions we've had. I'm sure it'll Thank be you. incredibly useful for everyone listening to this podcast. Um, Taylor, I don't know if you have anything else to say. No, we're just so grateful that you were able to to come and, and be with us. And I, I know I took a lot from, from this today as well, from trusting my gut to the multidisciplinary team and, you know, and listening. I think those are all really important things that you brought up and topics that I think that I definitely want to take away from this as well. So thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me and, um, you know, good luck with all of your work. This is an important endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Global Scalpels. If you're interested in learning more about this topic or the speaker, visit us on the web at globalscalpels.com or any of our social media platforms. Please subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube and Stitcher to hear more great content on a wide range of topics within global surgery. If you or someone you know is doing something in global surgery you feel should be highlighted in Global Scalpels, we would love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us today and hope to see you on our next episode.